as a documentary filmmaker, sometimes you're not fully prepared for the stories you uncover. Ah, the camera likes you. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> This is Justin, a sweet boy I never intended to meet. That's called a viewfinder. I'm going to turn it around. What do you think? You look ugly in that picture. Oh, you do not look ugly in that picture. Isn't that kind of cool? It's a little video camera. How do you do it? Here, I'll show you. But the first time I saw him, I just knew he was someone special. Is this the first time you've ever worked a video camera? Yeah. She's trying to figure out. How you do that? <laughs> go ahead, press it. There you go. Look at that. It's where I met him that haunts me. Thirty-five. I got one, day three, leaving ATU. Back to seat. At just 14 years old, Justin is a prisoner inside Pendleton Juvenile Correctional Facility, a maximum security juvenile prison where up to 400 boys ranging in age from 10 to 21 are locked up for charges ranging from drug possession to rape to murder. And it can be a really scary place. I've spent nearly two decades filming inside countless juvenile facilities and prisons. They are immensely sad confines where black and brown kids make up the overwhelming majority of faces behind bars. Their life stories are often tragic from a very early age, leading to anger, lack of hope, and all too often, a life in prison. I've always been in trouble. I've always been a juvenile. I got in a fight and gave somebody 15 stitches in his eye. Once you pull that trigger, it feels like it starts to twitch and you can't let go. I thought he was going to swing back, but he didn't, so I just kept on swinging on him. I figured the only way I can eat is to rob somebody. What do you oh, have? You what is it. that? <laughs> you got candy. Is that candy? <laughs> but Justin is not your typical inmate. And it was while filming at Pendleton Juvenile, when the prison was complete madness, that Justin caught my eye. Clearly, this was a boy with special needs. And after 17 years of doing this work, even I had to ask myself, what in the world is this child doing here? Hey, go get off that gay shit. Woodrum, Woodrum. You know he's on the gay shit. Come here, kid. What? I'm not sure. Do you hear about this? Where do you talk nice? Yeah. You hear me? Yeah. Uh, Justin, please get off the door. You have an injury. Oh, my. I bet you can't do it on speak that language. I bet I can. He's learned all this here. It's in there. Kate Frazier is a counselor at Pendleton Juvenile who has this extraordinary gift of working with these very troubled kids. And Kate really took Justin under her wing because she realized he had developmental disabilities. Hey, give me my candy. Hey, give me. What did he say? Please, please, thank you for not Ooh, having him. Kate knows Justin better than anyone, and he is what the prison calls a one-on-one -on -one child. His mental disabilities are so severe that they have to have one staff with him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Hey, get out of there. What is his IQ level? His you... IQ level is around 40. 40. Mm -hmm. And he's placed at this facility based upon the needs because mm -hmm. at this facility there is 24 hour medical care here. And because his IQ level and his functioning level is so low, he can't participate in the normal programming like a regular juvenile student is that's here. He can't take that in. He's not, his level of functioning is not enough to where that he understands anything that's being 
work with. Justin is a perfect example of a, of a kid who was here for all the wrong reasons. He, he absolutely did some things that were wrong, but when you look at his trauma that he's been through and you look at his, his mental health situation and things like that, you know, all prison did was make him worse. Mike Dempsey is the superintendent at Pendleton, and Mike has worked in prisons for decades. But he's inherited a mess at Pendleton. Have you been here before? Yes. Many of our kids that we have here, and Justin's a good case, he has nowhere to go. You know, he has no family out there who's willing to take him in and to provide him with the care that he needs. No mom, no dad. Um, Graham, Graham. Grandparents committed suicide, has sexually abused him. Uh, nobody can find mom, and even if we could find her, that probably wouldn't be the best outcome for Justin. Um, so, you know, the Department of Corrections and is left with figuring out what to do with that child. When you really boil it all down, what you have is you have a 14-year-old child who is in prison because he has nowhere to go. That's what it, that's what it boils down to. Politically, I've seen how difficult it is to change a system like this. And if Mike Dempsey wants to save kids like Justin, he'll have a tremendous battle ahead. You get frustrated and you try to figure out what can we possibly do is it going to make a difference. But you don't ever give up because you just never know when it, something might click with somebody. Go ahead and, and uh, just get started on greeting everybody. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming. This is an incredibly important issue uh, to the Department of Corrections, Division of Youth Services, and to particularly to the, the kids that we have in, inside our facilities, uh, that we just absolutely have to find a way and answer uh, to their reentry process. Um, this is not an issue that is unique to the state of Indiana. I think every state is attempting to deal with this issue and find resolutions or solutions to getting these kids or keeping these kids out of the prison system. What the Department of Correction is trying to do is find a placement facility, a place other than prison, that can give Justin the help and care that he needs. He's ready to be released from prison, but with no family, he has nowhere to go. And the longer he stays behind bars, the worse he gets. And the other kids that he is around um, recognize his disabilities and they take advantage of it. They take advantage of it very quickly. No matter how much the, the staff care, it's virtually impossible for that environment not to have a negative impact or influence on Justin's development. The one kid that we have been following closely um, is a 15-year-old child who was sentenced to the Department of Corrections the charge was child molesting. Yeah. But when you look at the, the actual case, that offense probably is an injustice in and of itself. This child was sexually abused at the age of five, mm -hmm. I believe. We haven't been able to locate his mother. We've been trying for over a year, I think. Yeah. He has an IQ of 42. 42, and he functions at the level of a second or third, second grade. Or third grade. So clearly this is a... Um, seriously traumatized and ill child who was sent to the Department of Corrections for child molestation. He was actually staying with um, friends of his, his mother. As I she actually lived there with this family who had two younger children. He was sitting at the dinner table. He wasn't getting the attention that he thought that he would be getting. He got upset with them because he asked for another port saw and they told him no and he got angry and left the, left the dinner table and actually touched and fondled the two children. His explanation for doing that was that he knew it would make the adults mad mm -hmm. and he was just trying to get them mad to get back for the fact that they didn't give him the attention or give him the extra pork chop. So more than likely he really had no idea what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it get worse in terms of his court hearing? Uh, is it the case that he was actually not represented by counsel? That We find that happens even more with... On, on a child molest yeah. charge with a 42 he, he, IQ, he was not represented. Yeah. We find this a lot um, with mental health case kids who enter the juvenile system and have absolutely no representation as they go through the court proceedings. Mm -hmm. No. 
In his case, he, he didn't have anybody representing him. How does this happen? I'm told it's really not that uncommon. In Indiana, every child is entitled to an attorney if they or their parents ask for one, but there is no requirement for a judge to appoint an attorney unless that request is made. Many times, it's not. It does come down to money. It's a sad reality, unfortunately. It truly is. And I mean, these are probably the most vulnerable kids that we have in the state. These kids shouldn't have any connection to DOC. These kids need the assistance from the social services and mental health side to meet those needs, not the prison side. That's just, that's just wrong. I think it was really productive. I think everybody takes a step back and says, how could that kid end up in prison with that history? Uh, to put the mechanism of the appeal in place? We have to put in place uh, other systems to prevent those kids from having to go to DOC because that's the only bed available. That's the problem. DOC is the only bed available for those types of kids. We have to figure out a better way to provide services to these kids. It's been um, a struggle and frustrating with where he's at mentally and emotionally. It's just, this is not the place, and it's just been really hard. Um, especially when he was going through his periods of extreme fear um, and not being able to, to reach him or calm him down in paranoia. It was, it was tough to watch. Kate explained that Justin was in constant fear. It was almost like he was having night terrors. He was seeing things, and his fear was so tangible. I mean, he was truly frightened, and um, I remember his eating habits started changing. I think he started losing weight really quick, but he was having very bad nightmares. He was afraid of uh, lots of the male staff, you know, hence the history that he dealt with. He seemed to be very bothered by a lot of the, the loud noises. Uh, I think he was it, he was afraid because he didn't understand his world. I mean, we weren't prepared for that, but we basically kept him with a staff, staff member at all times. Things are just getting a lot worse. I, I'm really thinking that our only option is to really look at Damar. You know, Carla and I had a sidebar conversation after that meeting um, and talked a little bit about the services that they provide at Damar, and I really think that that's probably going to be our only option. Damar is a placement facility about an hour away from Pendleton, known for its campus-like setting and work with kids with disabilities, kids just like Justin. Children are placed at Damar by the Department of Child Services or the Department of Education. The residential care and treatment here is expensive, but the outcomes are tangible. But Justin isn't a ward of the court or the Department of Education. He's a prison orphan. So technically, there's no agency to pay for his care here. Tell me more about what they do there and what, what's something like that going to cost. Well... <laughs> That, that's, that's one issue. I mean, it is, is it, it is expensive. Is this something that, that the other agency is going to pay for, or is this something that we're going to be on the hook for because we're placing them there? If, if we can place them there, we're going to have to, we're going to have to pay for those services, for, at least for right now, until we can come up with some other options. It's a lack of services, but really I think just as important is it's a lack of a way to pay for it. It's really an age-old problem, at least in our state, in that there are very, there's very little help for children who present with mental health issues. Um, and so because of that, how we get help, and it's, and it's not just a parental issue that parents do this. I mean, the system allows it to happen. It's just not right for children and families. Mike Dempsey and Chris Blessinger face a tough decision. Due to lack of funding and not enough coordination between state agencies, Getting Justin into Damar will take $350 a day out of their budget. And that's only if Damar accepts Justin.
I came back to Pendleton a week later to see what Mike and Chris had decided. We're going down to the unit to see Justin and um, his counselor, Kate Fraser, who's been working with him, is going to bring him down there and let him know that um, he is going to be leaving to go to Daymar on Monday. You tell them. I'm telling you, you're the one that needs the news, kiddo. You are going to go to Daymar next week, for real. And I'm going to go with you to take you there. Is that okay? Yeah. And I think it will be sooner than Friday. Would that be good too? But what's sooner than Friday? Like, would it be tomorrow? No, because we're still in this week. It's going to be next week. So I am leaving next week. Who's taking? Yes, us? you are leaving next week, and I'm going with you. Okay. I'm not, I'm not staying. I didn't get to talk to my damn mom. We can try to do that, okay? And you're cussing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, watch your mouth, buddy. Okay. <laughs> so, Justin, what do you think Daymar will be like? It's going to be you... a lot of fun. I might get to play video games. I might get to play outside. Don't have to do a lot, though. I bet you do. I bet you get to play outside. The, the cost was a huge issue. Um, for me, there are extreme cases, and he was definitely one of them. That you gotta take a stand and say he is in the wrong place, and you gotta do what you can to change that. After this, let me talk to my mom. Okay. okay. I'm gonna I'm show that. F me. Uh, it, 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 please, please. <laughs> <laughs> you did good though, you stopped it. You know, I realized long ago that. A lot of these kids are here because other people took the easy road and said this is the path that this child is on and it's not my respons responsibility to intervene in that. Well, I disagree with that 100%. You know, we are in a position where we can make a difference. Our fundamental responsibility is to improve outcomes for the kids that are entrusted to our care. We have an obligation to make sure that we do the right thing and we get them out of the system somehow. Now wait, how old are you now, Justin? 15. 15. When's your birthday? The morning I arrive for Justin's move to Daymar, I find him in waist and leg shackles. Hey! Buddy. And even though this is standard policy for the Department of Correction, it doesn't make it any easier to see. After a year and a half behind bars, hopefully he's headed to a much better place. But I also realize this. He's about to lose the one person he's come to trust. Kate Frazier. Is this a better place? Yes, it's a better place. But you know what's important? Well, that you don't cut the people. Okay, you have to be nice. Ready, Wood? Come on. Feel better? Yeah. You ready for you? I'm ready. Are you ready, kiddo? Just come. Deep breath. Justin. I'm Carla. Hi. And this is Angie. Hi. Nice to this meet you. Help me out today, okay? Hey, Justin. Angie's got something for you, okay? Do you like the Colts? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Did you happen to get to watch any of the game last night? Yeah, a little bit. That's a nice blanket. Okay, you ready to check out the place? Me. Okay. He's already off and running. Look at him. I have his. Hey, Justin. We're going to show you around later, but we want to take you to your new home first, okay? Right. Yeah. Okay. We're going to go up and over first. Up and over? Yep. He is leading the way. Was he now. Real? There you go, bud. Mm -hmm. Oh, look, you have a good view. I like 
the blue in here. What do you think? I like the blanket. You like the blanket? <laughs> That's <laughs> it. What do you think, Justin? Cool. You like it? I like it. Where's the pool at? Is that what you want to go see? Oh, right. Cool. Is this your favorite now? I like this better. You like this better? Yeah. Yay! Yay! <laughs> so as someone who's been with him since he was at... I'm very happy. <laughs> you know, I don't want to talk about it because you can make me cry. <laughs> and they make fun of me because of that. <laughs> no, he, he, this is good for him. He's good. It's nice. And to he's see. not even showing fear like he normally does with with different situations, so he feels safe. That's good. We play kickball out there. You get a run out there, don't you? Yeah, you want to run around the track? Hey. <laughs> really? <laughs> if you want to run around, do you go? He is running. He's gonna run. He's got energy. Look at him. <laughs> well, you know, think of how long it's been since he's been able to. It's like freedom. That's the first time outside of the gym that he's ran yeah. without getting in trouble. Like, because you can't run inside. Yeah. So, yeah, cool. He hasn't said a single cuss word. Mm -mm. You know what? I'm gonna go up front and sign some papers here real soon. I'm gonna go, on. I'm gonna go on back. You want to call Kate tomorrow and tell her how you're doing? Yay! Okay. Ooh. You know what? You even said shoot. Good job. <laughs> this is a pretty cool place. I'm going to miss you, though. No, I'm going to miss you. I know. I'm but gonna I call you. Okay, but I'm going to miss you, Justin. Uh, All right. The staff of Damar and I agree that for Justin to acclimate and begin intensive counseling, that he should really be free from any outside distractions. So while Justin starts to settle into his new environment, I start to look for answers. I find his dad's address and I take a drive. But when I get there, no one answers the door. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. The system is currently unavailable. And there's no way for me to leave a message. I then find Justin's mom online, but she never returns any of my messages. So I turned to former juvenile judge and head of Indiana's Department of Child Services, Mary Beth Bonaventura. Mary Beth wasn't in this job when Justin came into the system, but I hope she'll provide at least a glimpse into how a little boy like Justin could be completely abandoned by everyone in his family. It seems just unbelievable, doesn't it? Uh, but I don't think that that's unique, and I don't think, I think it's, it happens a lot. We've hired private investigators to find families for our children, especially our older youth, that have disconnected from their families because some of them will just say, you know, I can't handle these problems. I can't deal with my own life, much less their life, and they just disappear. And so these, these kids are just out there on their own. It's really tragic. It's not just Justin's family history that causes me to dig deeper into his story. I also realize his intellectual and developmental disabilities seem to have been overlooked throughout his life. So next, I head to Washington, D.C. to meet with Leanne Davis at an organization called The ARC. The ARC is the nation's largest nonprofit organization serving people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. According to recent research, we know that approximately 60 to 75 percent of youth with disabilities are in the juvenile justice system. And many times the disability may not even be recognized. 
A report that the National Disability Rights Network put out recently stated that 75% of youth with disabilities have experienced some type of trauma in their lives. So clearly, the resources are not there for every Justin in the world. They are not there. So the question is, how do we start taking the money that we're spending to house people and put it into community-based resources that we know works better and really provide these youth a chance to excel and to have another way of living. Ultimately, stories like Justin's rarely see the light of day. The wrenching stories from inside America's juvenile courts are presided over by juvenile judges who see both the best and oftentimes the absolute worst of the human condition. When I make a trip to the Indiana State House to meet with State Supreme Court Justices Loretta Rush and Stephen David, they confirm this heartache. Both Chief Justice Rush and Justice David are highly respected former juvenile judges themselves. These kids have had more trauma than you can ever imagine. Yes, Judge. They come to court just extremely traumatized, and our job as the court is to do justice for them, but to also make sure the system doesn't harm them more than they've already been harmed, and that can happen. I think the Department of Corrections has, has worked, has dramatically changed, and we're all sharing this. So if something goes wrong, we all feel bad about that. We all want to improve that, and I think that's the only way to make true progress, and I think, I think we are. It's a challenging um, issue that now both Justice David and I are continuing to work on from a statewide level so that you don't have these cases where these kids are um, not getting the best of what we can give them. Eighteen months go by as I try to piece together Justin's history. He and I keep in touch, and the people at Daymar keep me informed of his slow but steady progress. But I know that 18 months is a lifetime for a teenager. And as I get ready to visit Justin again for the first time in over a year and a half, I can't help but wonder just how much he's changed since I saw him last. Hey, get up. How are you? Good. I bet, has he been here? He's what? been here since September of 2010. Okay. So we're going on two years, Justin, right? That's right. Hard to believe. When he first came here, he had all kinds of inappropriate behaviors. Um, Physical aggression, refusal. Um, I think he'd been isolated quite a bit, and I think maybe even he wanted to continue to be isolated. But he, he's not doing any of those behaviors now. There's a lot of good people here who work with him and care about him a lot. All right, kiddo, show me around. Justin, the first day, that's the playground that you ran to. Do you remember it all? Yeah. I remember going to that one down here. Okay, you take us to Mr. Trimblet's classroom, okay? I will. Justin's basically a non-reader, but we've adapted his IEP where he's learning functional skills and life skills. Um, he should start a job in the community here in about two months. He'll always need supports some type of support and supervision. Is this your classroom? This is a harder one. I want to use it a little? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Have you had another boy like him? Through the Department of Corrections, I don't think we've ever had a child who has no family contact. Mm. Well, there you go. Yay! Good job, bud. I bet you guys don't have one of those DOC. Yeah. <laughs> no, DOC does not have one of those. It's called a smart board. A smart board. Yep. You think I need to go back to Pendleton and tell them they need to get a smart board for all the boys at Pendleton? No, tell them I'm coming back. Tell them you're coming back? Yo. Oh. What would you want to do if you went back to Pendleton? Would you want to go visit some of the staff? 
Maybe we could do that. Yeah. yeah. Would you want to try and do that sometime? I know Kate would love to see you. Yeah, that would be cool. That would be cool? Yeah. I'm going to work on that, okay? Uh-huh. Along the way, Carla tells me about this special relationship that Justin has developed with his counselor at Daymar, Fred. I'm going to get your basketball seat. The relationship with them is amazing, and Fred really is working on um, making sure that Justin will be safe in the community. Um, he's, he's a wonderful man, a wonderful role model for Justin. You'd almost think it would be difficult for him to attach. No, it, it hasn't been. He, he wants someone to connect to. He does. You said three-pointer. Sure. He tells me every time we have an interview of therapy, Mr. Fred, you don't understand what I go through. Everybody gets to go home, and I don't have anywhere to go. So that really touches my heart. Um, I have made several phone calls to every family member I have in the books, and haven't been able to get in touch with any one of them. So he's just really a very special kid to me. We are working on a whole lot of issues. And uh, my focus really is try to improve on, on his social skills. He hasn't expressed any affection in his life in a very long time. And I want him to feel that uh, people care about him, people love him. At the same time, because of the sexual issues he's had in the past, mm -hmm. being a victim, I also don't want him to use that as a way of you know, being inappropriate. And um, I think he's been pretty good. I understand his issues. I can relate to them. I'm glad that every day I can walk with somebody like Justin to make a difference in his life. Sorry, no much. <laughs> Everything all right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I, I can beat him bowling, right? Yeah. No, did I tell you I I, I won seventy? I mean, uh, I won 70, 71 points. In bowling? Yeah. You got a 71? Yeah. Did you beat your friend? Yeah, I'm an old man. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, friend. <laughs> I am amazed at how deeply Justin is attached to Fred. And it's during my visit with the two of them that I realize this one simple thing. For Justin, all he's ever wanted is family. And so far at Pendleton and at Daymar, he's been lucky to find special people to step into that role. I think I dialed into Justin when I realized that Justin wasn't okay. It was like a, a process with him. At least that's my memory of it. Like he was kind of okay at first. Like he came in and his version of cussing was calling somebody a porcupine. That was the extent of how he would be aggressive towards people verbally. And then what he learned here rather quickly is he learned like the gang symbols and had no idea what he was throwing up. And he learned the cussing and um, he started to, I started having nightmares and he was, suddenly he just became afraid of everything. It was like he was fine one day and the next day he was, he was terrified of everything. So what do you think? Does it, do you remember it? Not really. Don't remember it. He remembered it driving by. Yeah, I remember What'd you it. Because we drove right past it and he was like, there it is. <laughs> All right, bud, let's go. <laughs> Justin, how are you? Good. Stay out of trouble. <laughs> Do you remember Mr. Courtney? Yep, I do. <laughs> yeah? It looked like he shaved his hair. I did. I shaved my beard. <laughs> well, you know what, Justin? I think we're going to take you back into the conference room and get you settled back there, and then we'll have everybody who wants to come visit you come in, okay? Yep. Does that sound good? Yep.
Kate Frazier! Justin Woodrum. What's up? Hi. Wow, look at you. You know? I'm happy to see you, young man. Wow. How are you? Good. Can I see you? Stand? Let me stand up next to you. Oh, wow. <laughs> what do you do? What's, what's your life looking like now? Good. I, I get to do outings and stuff like that. Awesome. Are you happy? Mm-hmm. I like that. Happy's good, huh? Yep. What's your favorite subject in school now? Math, reading. I'm playing on the smart board. Uh -huh. I got a smart board. Do they have a smart board? Very nice. <laughs> it's really good to see you. It's really good to see you too. Thank you. Do you even remember what it's like back in the units at all? Nope, I can't. Can't remember that. I moved on so much. No, that's what they said to me out there. That you're not even going to recognize me. <laughs> wow. This is a good day. Mm -hmm. What's your dream? The dream place you said you want to go visit? California. Do you want to tell Kate what it is you want to see when you get to California? Do you want to talk about that? The a ocean. Bit? Oh. That's called the Pacific, and you know what it's called down by Florida? Atlantic Ocean. Very good. <laughs> You've been busy learning and working, haven't you, Justin? Yeah. Uh-huh. Good job. I had no idea the day that I went with you to Daymar that I would ever see you again. So, <laughs> this is pretty special to me because that doesn't always happen. We don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And you mattered. And I'm very proud of you. Came a long way, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Let me bye. <laughs> very happy to see you. Mm -hmm. You take care. I will. Keep in touch. Good luck. See you. Wow. He's grown. And the fact that he could say what ocean that was when he couldn't even spell his own name. That's why I started crying when he said Atlantic because, wow. <laughs> I hope that he finds a family. Um, I don't define family by blood. I hope Justin finds a family and feels that that this is my family. That's that's my hope for him. And that Justin um, is just happy with, with the things that make Justin happy. With his 18th birthday approaching, it's time for Justin to transition out of Daymar. But with no family to turn to, the hope is that the Indiana Bureau of Developmental Disabilities will allow Justin to move to a children's group home run by Damar. After months of waiting, approval finally comes at the last minute. And once again, we're all witness to yet another monumental change in Justin's life. So tell me what's coming up tomorrow. Leaving. Leaving? Yep. Where are you going? To a group home. To a group home? Yep. So how do you feel about that? Good. We are really excited. Um, Justin has made a lot of progress in treatment. So he's living for a less restrictive environment. Mm -hmm. Typically, um, that's what we look for in all of our kids, mm -hmm. to move from campus back into the community. Mm -hmm. So Justin is moving tomorrow, and he's really excited. Are you going to be sad to leave at all? Nah. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I miss Mr. Fred, though. What'd you say? I said I'm going to miss Mr. Fred, though. He's a good manager. I'm going to miss you, too. Yeah, honestly, I am. Here we go, buddy. We're waiting on you. Starving. Now that he's moving out, you know, going back to the community, meeting new friends, and then, you know, those are going to be his family. Um, some kids live here and go home. Justin is going to another home. And um, it's going to be a whole new set of people. All right, good job. You guys can come in. I think that is good for him, and we're really, really proud that he's leaving tomorrow. Uh, Justin? Huh? Everybody, can take a break? My fault. 
Thank you for this food. Thank you for this day. Let's have. Let's hope everybody goes on with their life. And thank you, Lord. Tonight, this is last night. It's been. I'm um, looking forward to this night for a very long time. Can you believe this day is finally here? Yeah. Yeah. How do you feel? I feel good and happy. This day did did happen. You leave. Come right to it. Yeah. Let's go. Going out the candy. As Justin transitions to yet another home, he'll have more freedom, but he'll also have more responsibility. Oh, how nice. This is your new home. Yeah. Hello. Hi, babe. What's up? How are you? Good. We're very excited about Justin being here. We teach a lot of independent living skills. Um, we have the boys do as much as they possibly can here on their own, and we assist them with what they need help with. I like it. They do their laundry, they do the house chores, um, cooking, all that kind of stuff here. That's all them. Basically, that's how they learn their independent skills, so hopefully that we can see Justin move on to some kind of an adult living situation. You ready? You straight? Uh, I'm hopeful this new move goes well for Justin, but with more independence and no family support, his safety net also gets smaller and smaller. Sometimes these kids are forgotten, not only by people in the community, but some of them even by their own parents. We do have a lot of clothes. That's a good thing, Tracy. When we do know that there is a child that's been abused or neglected, the earlier that we can intervene, the better. I think that if Justin had had services early on, there's no question. There are great service providers out there that deal with trauma, that deal with low IQs, and being able to access those before it really escalates into something that rolls into a huge problem would have been ideal for Justin. Mike Dempsey and Mary Beth Bonaventura are working to fix that for other kids ensnared in the system. So we've uh, formed this group, the Department of Corrections through Mike Dempsey and our agency to, to try to uh, brainstorm around uh, people that are being released from the juvenile facility to determine you know, what help we can get them and who we can connect them with. A lot has changed since the time I met Justin so long ago. Indiana has implemented several reforms to prevent another case like his from falling through the cracks. And Indiana Supreme Court Justices Loretta Rush and Steve David were the first ones to make sure that all kids like Justin now receive lawyers in court. They showed us that a number of kids were going to DOC um, without ever having talked to an attorney, and we decided as a court we were going to change that rule. We got the support from, you know, we had every juvenile judge in the state be able to weigh in on it, and it was passed and enacted, and it's in place right now. It's much easier to fix children than repair adults. It's a challenge we all share. We all share the successes, and we all have to share the failures. The ultimate goal is to make sure that these kids are in the right place for the right reasons, and for the right length of time in order to get those services. After 17 years filming inside juvenile courts, I often think I've seen it all. Extraordinary work by compassionate professionals who see the unthinkable, and juvenile judges who every day must decide the fate of thousands of kids. It can be an exhausting yet life-changing job in every imaginable way. It was for former juvenile judge Mary Beth Bonaventura. She adopted the love of her life, her son Sonny, when he landed in her court as a lonely, abandoned 10-year-old boy. Judges like Loretta Rush and Steve David also remember the kids they met and cared for during their time on the juvenile bench. You invest yourself a lot with these kids. In my bench and as in Justice David's, 
um, you take their stories with you. You don't just leave them there. I had, under the glass on my bench, I had hundreds of pictures of the kids that had come before me, and you, and you remember them, yeah, and you, you worry about them. But sometimes, as in Justin's case, things go horribly wrong. It obviously did with Justin's family. And when I reached out to the retired juvenile judge who handled Justin's case, I hoped I'd at least find closure on how anyone could sentence a 14-year-old boy like Justin to a maximum security juvenile prison. The judge wouldn't agree to an interview on camera. Instead, he sent me this response. I do not remember many cases in the 18 years I was a juvenile judge. I would have followed the recommendations of the probation department and the child welfare department. I made it my policy to not remember cases so I could sleep at night. It's hard to believe that I'm now on my way to Justin's group home for his 18th birthday party. We've watched this boy go through so much over the past five years, and we all know his journey isn't over yet. He can't stay at this children's group home forever, just like he couldn't stay at Damar. There's already talk of finding him an adult group home, but for today, we're just going to make this a happy day and celebrate Justin turning 18. Hey! Who's the big 18-year-old boy? Don't drop it! I know we're down. Justin, I, I'm so proud of you. Love, Karen. One, two, three. Happy birthday to... When I met Justin so long ago, I had no idea of the journey we'd take together. But what happens to the thousands of other kids who don't have a Mike Dempsey or a Kate Frazier or a Damar or a Fred. It's really gonna have a blue tongue. <laughs> Take me for a ride, Karen. Take you for a ride? Yeah. Where do you wanna go for a ride? Easy, somewhere around the block. All right, then we're in the car. Yeah. See you in a bit. See you. Go home for a birthday drive. <laughs> All right, when I get up here, do you want me to turn right or left? Left. So have you had any other visitors at all? Nope. My mom ain't visited me either. She hasn't? Nope. I don't know what's up with her, but I did talk to her when I was on campus when she when uh, Michelle bought me that Taco Bell and that stuff, but I ain't seen her since. How long ago was that? Do you remember? About six years ago. What would you want to tell her if you saw her? I'm going to go home. You want to go home? Yeah. Are you going to maybe keep trying over time to see if you can... Find your mom or get in touch with your mom? I don't think that it's never going to happen. Because we've been trying to get a hold of her for so long that I don't think it's going to happen. She's either not calling back or she's just lost somewhere. Mm. What do you think about that? I miss her. Everybody's talking about basketball, March Madness this, March Madness that. Well, the good thing is... I'm in a group home. That's right. Where everybody loves you and you're doing really well. Yeah. So that's what's important. Yep. Do you still want to go to California someday? Yeah. Tell me why you want to go to California. So I can see the girls. <laughs> There's Damar. Yep, there goes Damar. Take a picture of it. For Justin, there will always be a level of uncertainty about what comes next. Mike Dempsey, who is now the head of all juvenile services for the Department of Correction, has gone on to radically change the culture and climate at Pendleton Juvenile. He continues to fight to close the unit that houses kids with disabilities. Well, we're trying extremely hard to, uh, to not have any more kids in this unit. Um, to, uh, uh, I'm hopeful that the day is quickly approaching where we can say that this unit has been closed down because we don't have kids with, mental, with serious mental health problems committed to the Department of Corrections anymore. 
This is happening everywhere. It's happening in every state. Every state that I've talked to struggles with this issue. The prisons, whether they're adult or juvenile, have become the, the mental health providers for offenders or kids with disabilities. We're going to work hard to make sure that these staff identify those kids up front and that the judge has the options and the available services to put these kids somewhere else, put the kids where they need to be. We've identified what those problems are and we're really working hard in Indiana to, to make a difference in these people's lives. Shouldn't we, after all, want for someone else's children what we want for our own? Uh, and so to provide them with some kind of safety net and support system is the ultimate goal here. That goal is also being realized thanks to a reform effort called the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative, or JDAI, an effort adopted by 40 states across America, including Indiana. In Indiana, we went from 1,200 children in DOC to now we have about 400 children in. We've been able, you know, two facilities have been closed. It, it has really been a sea change. As for Justin, he continues to amaze me every single day. And I know I'll never be able to fully comprehend what he's been through in his life. But then again, whoever expected this? And your winner for prom king, Justin Wilson. From prison to prom king. For that, I am so grateful.